If you really want to achieve change, know that even if you have a good idea, you will lose in the back rooms against the forces that are entrenched unless you have the people lined up at the front door. And to get the people lined up at the front door, you have to organize, you have to build partnerships, and you have to be able to point people towards um, a place where they can feel powerful as part of those efforts. Rashad, thank you. You're very welcome to Summer Sessions. Thank you so much for joining us. How's the event going for you so far? It's been great. I, um, I love um, my session earlier, but I also like have loved walking around and seeing um, so many familiar faces, um, people that you know, I've worked with and you know, engaged with in different ways. Actually, as we were just walking in, I saw uh, President Obama, one of his, President Obama's former chiefs of staff, yeah. um, and uh, who I was just recently with um, at Stanford University um, after the president had given a speech about misinformation and disinformation, particularly around tech and, and um, you know, issues impacting our democracy. And so there's just such a confluence or maybe a collision mm. um, of different sort of um, uh, practices, people, um, issues. And, um, you know, that's really exciting. Absolutely. And speaking of these kind of congregations of people, you know, when it comes to when we talk about the big topics, you know, so civil rights, uh, disinformation, misinformation, how important do you think these sessions are, even though they are quick fire on stage? But do you feel like they do help move the needle in terms of the next step in what it is in, in a movement? Well, I think people need um, uh, action steps. People need direction on what to do next, what's going to be most meaningful in terms of making progress. And so uh, if conversations can be focused on what does it take um, to move us forward? What does it take to move us out of the conversation into action? I think that's incredibly important. And what's, um, you know, been sort of convened here in terms of the type of people are people who have sort of influence in all different types of spaces, have networks and platforms. And so, you know, when I was on stage, my goal was really to try to speak to people as influencers in their own space, as nodes, and trying to hopefully um, get them to think about what do they do in their individual spaces when they leave. And so uh, almost accepting that a lot of these people are going to either be on my side or close enough on my side that I want to activate them. And I think um, activation, if you think about issues like civil rights, think about issues like misinformation, disinformation, think about issues like equity. We can be in conversations forever. Right now, what we need is action. Very, very true. Couldn't agree more. Um, as president of Color of Change, who are your role models? Who would you like the children of today to look up to today and tomorrow? You know, it's it's so interesting. Well, you know, in the last couple of um, months, I've had the sort of pleasure of coming across a lot of educators who are fighting back against some of the attacks on teaching black history, teaching a full American history. And some of these teachers that we've actually, uh, just some of whom we've, we've given awards to at our Black History Now um, celebration are some of the heroes that I like to think of. People in their everyday communities, when something hits, they are standing up and trying to provide a path forward, making sure with a recognition that um, black history is American history and that we actually won't move forward if we don't have to understand our past. You know, on a like, you know, level of like kind of people I think of as icons in, in, in that sort of space, you know, I think of people who were the strategists of movements. I think of folks like Bayard Rustin who planned the March on Washington um, with A. Philip Randolph and did a lot of work to figure out like, you know, how to get people from point A to B, but also what were the demands and the asks going to be? Not just like having a march, but what, what were going to be the things that we made, um, we asked people and demanded of the government, what was going to be the sort of uh, ideas of power um, as it related to um, forcing institutions to do something different. I think about um, the, one of the co-founders of Color of Change, James Rucker, who founded this organization that I get to lead now in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, but put his time, energy, sweat, his family's resources behind building a piece of infrastructure that would continue to work long after he was not directly involved with it. Um, there, for me, there are so many um, you know, folks every day. I also think about the, the storytellers. 
um, out in the world, whether it's the Ida B. Wells uh, from a journalist perspective who put herself in so much danger, um, or it's the kind of current storytellers who are shaping stories for a new generation, the Ava DuVernay's, the Issa Rae's, all of these folks who are out there building infrastructure and building platform and helping us be able to see a world um, where we are truly reflected. Mm. Ava DuVernay, a goat. <laughs> um, speaking of black history, uh, we've just passed by Juneteenth. What are your thoughts about it being recognized by large tech companies? Is it honoring the holiday or ticking a corporate box? It's ticking a corporate box, right? So much of the technology that is, uh, should be taking us into the future is dragging us backwards. Mm. I, I say that at the same time that uh, just because it's ticking a box doesn't mean that we can't strategically find ways to use it. And so a conversation has been opened up. An opportunity to educate has been opened up. What we do next with it is now our opportunity. And I don't mean just black folks. I mean all people who believe in justice and recognize that in order for us to live collectively, we have to um, level the playing field, uh, change the power structure, change the rules. And so, you know, when I think about Juneteenth, I think of it as an opportunity to fully um, teach uh, the sort of history of the challenges and the atrocities, but also the multiracial coalitions of people who came together to win more freedom, to win more equity. That is much a part of the story as the legacy of the um, oppression, of the abuse, of the uh, forced servitude. There's a legacy also of progress, a legacy of people fighting back, a legacy of people standing up and pushing. And both of those stories have to be part of the story that we tell. You know, at Color of Change, we talk a lot about black joy. And black joy is not the absence of pain, but the presence of aspiration, not just what we are fighting against, but what we are fighting for. And so, you know, when I think of corporations um, who, you know, continue to put us in harm's way through their policies and practices, um, saying things about Juneteenth Day or Black History Month or celebrating Martin Luther King, what I think is it's an opportunity, an opportunity and an invitation for us to take those statements and actually put some accountability, put some action, put some demands um, on the table. Amazing. Um, are there any questions that you never get asked these kind of events that you would love to address? I feel like I get asked a lot about the current and the past, but maybe not enough about the future. And, you know, I think a lot about the future. I think this work for me um, is so much connected to the future. It's connected to how I think about the world for my niece and nephews. It's about how I think about the world for myself and my family um, and the sort of future of, of what does it mean when we win more equity and more freedom? What does it mean for the time um, that people will get to devote to all sorts of other things in their lives and, and get to um, enjoy other things besides fighting against imbalances and justice and equity. And so, you know, I hope um, over the coming years that I just get to get to dream more about the future and also through my work get to tell more stories about the future that I hope to us to all live in. It doesn't mean that we uh, don't continue to help people understand the past and the pain and even the present challenges. But um, we also have to be able to dream of a future if we're going to be able to walk into it together. And so as leader in chief of one of the most progressive civil rights advocacy organizations in, North, in North America, but in terms of per capita in the world, mm -hmm. when we're talking about the future, so you're saying you admire chief strategists. How do you map? Do you look three years down the line, one year down the line? Mm -hmm. Where do you see color change five years down the line? Where, what are your ways of strategizing? I think in terms of the many of the actions we're taking, the kind of things in front of us as, you know, a year, two years, three years down the line, um, especially in the policy space, recognizing the dynamics of what we can get done will depend on sort of who 
um, is nervous about disappointing us and, how, and who's in office. And so that's all important. But in the cultural advocacy space, as I think about the stories we get to tell, whether it's through platforms that you know, are already out there in Hollywood or the platforms that we want to build, whether I think about uh, the accountability on big tech and the, all the tools that will uh, um, create more opportunity for us to come together, but also can supercharge uh, an imbalance, um, uh, disinformation, misinformation. Um, I think, I try to think far down the road and recognize that um, there are sometimes things that can feel, um, there are invitations oftentimes from corporations to partner or engage that may feel very good in the, on the front end, you know, take a check now and we'll sponsor an event and, you know, we'll do something together all while they're on the side, you know, giving money to politicians who want to um, ban black history or want to uh, suppress voter voting rights. You know, I think about, um, you know, even as I think about the intersectionality of the work to move us forward. And I, and I see pride parades um, this June all around the country and you see major corporations with floats in those pride parades and you know, folks dancing on the floats and them celebrating love is love while they are giving money to politicians who are fighting to pass don't say gay bills in states around the country. You know, part of what we try to do at Color of Change is not mistake that presence for power, to recognize the difference between shout outs uh, and words and the actual actions folks take. The money that people put behind the things that can put us in harm's way while saying things that may feel really good, um, if we accept that, that is short-sighted. And so when I say thinking long-term, it might mean sacrificing some resources and dollars to my organization in order to do the type of accountability work that will actually make us uh, more free, um, to make our society more just years ahead. Huge, thank you for that. Why do you think coming to an inter international tech event like this is important for political activists? Well, I think activists should be in all the spaces that shape our lives. And so, you know, if I think about the power centers, whether they be government, um, tech in Silicon Valley, but tech is very broad, not just U.S., right? If I think about the culture space in the U.S., it's, it's Hollywood, but it's, it's other cultural spaces, theater and music. And, and if I think about corporations, we have to contend in all of those spaces if we want to be able to shape um, a world where the rules um, can be on our side, where society can be on our side. And so when I talk about power, I'm not just talking about power from the sort of political government perspective. I'm talking about all of the sort of spaces that get to shape whether or not we have more opportunities, whether or not the uh, kind of society is on our side, whether or not we get the benefit of the doubt. All of those things, I think, are incredibly important. So being at a conference like this, um, where people are trying to be inside of a conversation about the future. Um, if you care about the future, then you need to be inside of these spaces. And one final question. If the audience could walk away with one key takeaway from your talk, what would it be? If um, the audience could walk away with one key takeaway, it's, it's that we um, have to actually be part of something bigger. That there is something about tech and there is something about um, the conversations around tech today that makes us think that we can change things all on our own. Um, and the forces that are entrenched and holding us back actually want us to go into our individual silos and work on our individual things or think that as an individual person I can, I can overcome um, deep systemic suppression. Now, you might have sort of a, a, a moment you know, you might have something that may feel good in the moment, but true structural change requires collective action. And I think um, in this era where sometimes we can be uh, very anti-institutional, um, in this era where I think people oftentimes want to go at it on their own, that 
um, collective action is going to be what is required to actually move us forward and actually dismantle the real forces that hold us back. So the thing I hope that people will take away is that um, if you really want to achieve change, know that even if you have a good idea, you will lose in the back rooms against the forces that are entrenched unless you have the people lined up at the front door. And to get the people lined up at the front door, you have to organize, you have to build partnerships, and you have to be able to point people towards um, a place where they can feel powerful as part of those efforts. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate for you. Thank All you right. very Thank much. You. Thank you.